that. <laughs> All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Arif Khan, and I am the director of the University of New Mexico Art Museum. I'd like to welcome all of you here in Keller Hall, as well as all the folks joining us uh, on the live stream. So, so glad you could all come out, and what, what a great turnout on the Saturday afternoon. Um, we are here for the national premiere of Transformations, which is organized by the Dana Tasun Burgess Dance Company and the UNM Art Museum. This presentation of Transformations is made possible by a grant from the Terra Foundation for American Art and with additional support from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, the Nearing Stiftung Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Our local support includes a gift by College of Fine Arts donors Robert and Janet Ford, thank you very much, and sponsorship by uh, Media Desk, the New Mexico Humanities Council, the UNM's College of Fine Arts, and UNM Press. It takes a village to put these performances on. So thank you so much, everyone, for your support. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Rebecca Smith and Liz Racone uh, here at Keller Hall for working with us. Uh, this is a busy time of the year at the end of the semester. Um, there are student recitals after this, so they are still working into the evening. Um, really appreciate all your help and willingness to help us host this event as well as Richard Hess from the Theater and Dance Department, who helped with um, getting this dance floor here in Keller Hall. Um, let's see. I'd also, of course, like to thank all of the staff at the UNM Art Museum, and specifically our museum student staff, uh, who I'm sure you've met as you're coming in. Uh, we rely on our students to, and their wonderful help for us at the museum. Uh, of our staff, I want to specifically acknowledge uh, Devin Dracy, our Manager of Communications and Audio Engagement. Uh, this event would not have been possible without all of our hard work and admirable organizational skills. So a round of applause for everyone who helped make this possible. <laughs> so I know um, we are uh, to be cognizant of the time, so um, I'm going to keep the introductions brief. But in the program you have, um, you can learn about all the amazing artists who will be performing here today and uh, their careers, the education, etc. Um, but to start off briefly, uh, now in its 30th season, the Dana Tasun Burgess Dance Company is the preeminent modern dance company of Washington, D.C. Its repertory focuses on identity in the context of historical events and personal stories, thereby connecting the shared human experience and showcasing cultural confluence. Dana is the founding artistic director of the company, and since 2016, he has served as the first ever Smithsonian choreographer in residence. Based at the National Portrait Gallery, his company creates new works inspired by cutting edge exhibitions, hosts open rehearsals, and provides an opportunity for audiences to experience dance, as well as understand and witness its creative process. Dana also happens to be an alum of the University of New Mexico Theater Dance uh, Department, and so happy to have Dana back here on campus. Uh, also to my left is Patricia Michaels of Taos Pueblo. She is a world-renowned fashion and textile designer. She has studied at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, the Chicago Art Institute, where she studied with uh, artist Nick Cave, who coincidentally uh, did a talk in this very hall, and a residency at Tamron Institute in 2015. Uh, Patricia has worked at the Santa Fe Opera and designed costumes for Opera Lafayette, who performed at the Kennedy Center. You might have heard of that one. Uh, Patricia also uh, was selected by the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, who awarded her the first inaugural Arts and Design Award. There is many more impressive things that both of these individuals have done. Please check out your program for those. All right, we'll get into our conversation. And I guess maybe some of you wondering, why is this happening here today? Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Dana um, in November, this past November, uh, for a theater and dance event up in Santa Fe and uh, told me about this piece he was working on that was inspired by the Transcendental Painters Group. Um, many of you may know this was a group of artists, uh, an artist collective that was formed in Santa Fe and Taos in 1938. Um, and many of the founding members have close ties to the UNM Art Museum and the university. Uh, our museum has significant holdings of their work as well as their archival materials in our own collection. Uh, 
So of course I was really interested to hear what Dana was working on and I'm really glad that this performance happened so quickly. I think we were saying initially, oh, maybe the next year or two we'll do this, but uh, <laughs> we decided to do it much sooner than that. So, um, so to get started, Dana, um, maybe I thought briefly I mentioned you're an alum and um, just curious if you want to talk just briefly about your how uh, being a student here at UNM launched you in your career, and I don't know if that helped inspire you maybe to work with museums and the visual arts with, with your dance as well. Absolutely. Um, I actually came to the University of New Mexico thinking that I was going to be an accounting major. And <laughs> so, but my parents are both visual artists. I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and um, I grew up in the midst of the creative process, which was great. But I just kept thinking, oh, when I go to the university, I have to actually study something different. So um, I went to accounting classes and realized just how um, horrible I was at them. And so I started to just wander during class time. And I wandered into the dance building here at the University of New Mexico. And I was sort of drawn, like there was this Pied Piper in there to the music and to the movement. And I literally just sort of snuck into some classes and was just completely enamored by the teachers there, uh, such as Jennifer Predock Linnell and um, Judith Benaham. And one day one of my teachers said, oh, we, you know, you're doing really well in this class, but if you don't sign up for this class, you can't take this class anymore. So I became a dance major <laughs> and it really changed my life. It completely transformed um, my understanding of art because I had always been around visual artists who were my parents and their sort of cadre of friends. But when I realized that the body could actually be an artistic form, that um, a kinesthetic sensibility and a choreographic sensibility could be art and it could be a career, uh, that's what really, I think, set me on a path uh, for the rest of my life. That's great, Dana. Um, so I mentioned you um, being Smithsonian choreographer in residence and that you have done and are still working on pieces that are uh, designed to be performed in art museums and galleries. Um, how, did, how did that process come about? Sure. Um, in 2013, the Smithsonian launched a new exhibition entitled Dancing the Dream, and it was the history of American dance, both modern dance, ballet, tap, Broadway, show dance, etc. And I received a phone call from a historian named Amy Henderson, and she said, you know, we are going to include an image of you in this exhibit. Would you like to come down and um, talk to me about how you might envision dance going along with an exhibition about dance because there was the visual component but not the actual physical component yet. So I met with Amy and we spoke about creating one of the exhibition halls with a dance floor so that I could be in there with the company, develop work so the public could come in week after week and see how a dance is developed and then ultimately perform the dance um, during the run of the exhibition. So I did a couple of new premieres there. And at the end of that, the director of the museum, Kim Sayet, had uh, came up to me and said, oh, you know, maybe we can make this into a special position for you. So it took about two years to move through the institution all the way to the top of the institution back down again to create a new position. And um, it was created and I started to, um, choreographed two or more works per year based on the exhibitions at the National Portrait Gallery. And prior to that, I had worked with a lot of visual artists and had worked in different museums and knew that I just loved that to get out of the normal dance studio, which is sort of just a, a box with a wall of mirrors. So it gives this opportunity to understand the world in a more three-dimensional way. So that's really how it, how it came about. And, and uh, this specific piece we're seeing tonight, Transformations, um, with the Transcendental Painters Group, how were, was that something you wanted to do or was someone, were you approached by an institution to do that? Sure. 
you know, this is such a um, serendipitous story because I was approached originally by um, LA County Museum of Art to um, consider an exhibition that they had um, on the Transcendental Painting Group from 1938 to 1942, specifically those works. And so we were talking about that, et cetera, and I really just fell in love with the idea. And then the plans for that shifted in terms of dates and, and timing and programming. And I had just been here in New Mexico and I was like, oh my gosh, this actually, this piece should premiere here. I wonder if we can collaborate on that. And so this, this will be the premiere, which we're really excited about being here in New Mexico because I think that ultimately that's where this piece should premiere since it is so New Mexico at its heart. Um, and then from here on the 14th of the month, it'll be at the National Portrait Gallery and at the, on November 30th, it'll be the County Center. That's great, Dana, thanks. So uh, Patricia, actually we have, we have three folks who are raised here in New Mexico. I think that's rare for the arts uh, here, which is great. Um, but you also grew up, you, you and Dana grew up together, uh, went to high school, et cetera. Um, how, how uh, maybe talk about did Dana approach you for this specifically, or uh, how did this get going for you? So, so yes, um, Dana and I survived Santa Fe High School. <laughs> we were odd. <laughs> but I think being odd we bonded our friendship together, and, um, and it led us to be really strong in the world of arts because, as you know, in order to survive in the arts, you have to have the courage and the wisdom to really foresee your vision. Um, I didn't dress typical in high school and that's what attracted him to me because he said, oh, you're always dressed so interesting, and so beautiful. And so I was like, yeah. And so um, I saw him, it was in the fall, right? Was it when you did the performance here? Yeah. And I was, I was in tears. The performance that he choreographed was just, absolutely beautiful and I'm sitting there crying and afterward because it's you know made me happy and joyous and the way he expresses the the movement and the body you know just marries so beautifully into how I picture being ethereal and when I do my designs and so his play of light and movement was just gorgeous and Afterwards, he approached me and he said, I want to talk to you about something to see if you're interested in doing another collaboration with me because we had done one prior in Santa Fe at the Barn House for yeah. the children. National Dance Institute. Yes, and yeah. that was for the story of La Llorona. And so I made these like soggy, sad flowers. <laughs> that <laughs> so those were the costumes for La Garona, obviously why, right? Yeah. So um, so he called me and, and I, he said, it's going to be the transcendental period. And I said, oh, that's perfect. I'm familiar. I sold some of those paintings in a gallery that my ex and I had in Taos before. I lived with in Mal Bistrom paintings and seen homes with collections of these paintings. Very familiar with what the play of light is. And it's it's almost like nonsensical sometimes. So it makes it fun. And that, that's kind of how we were in high school anyway. <laughs> so I, I ran with it and I my daughter, Margot Abeta, she just finished getting her degree in digital design communications. And she was like, mom, I'm just like so bored. I don't know, I just graduated. I feel like I can't do anything. And I said, okay, do this project with me. She said, what is it about? And I'm like, it's the <laughs> transcendental period of painting. She goes, I don't know anything about it. I said, you, yes, you do. You grew up with these paintings in the house. So I'll send you some images. She goes, oh, okay, I got this, I got this. What, it was like three days later? Yeah. And yeah. she had these beautiful textiles for us to choose from. Totally. I mean, she's just spot on. This wonderful sense of energy. And and then so Dana goes, can we do some more with some more white in there? So she, she just kept pouring out all this beautiful imagery. And then and then we start to do the silhouettes. And then, you know, we start to do fabrics. And then we redo the fabrics and we choose uh, sequences. And we're sewing sequence yesterday. <laughs> the last minute. <laughs> 
because that's just the way it goes. Um, and, and so I think with all of this, um, growing up was a family of dancers from Taos Pueblo and everybody was a competitive dancer. I knew that I didn't want to be a competitive dancer because another trophy, another award for dancing to me was defeating any kind of accomplishment in my family. So I used to imagine what a beautiful dance outfit would look like or what a beautiful garment would look like. So when the competition was going, the song was over and I'm still dancing and my family didn't understand like, what is the matter with you? But it was, I was trying to capture light and movement with a garment when I was a child. And that's why I do fashion. Yeah. So <laughs> did Dana, did you have um, a knowledge of the painters group um, growing up here or was this project kind of your first uh, interaction with them? Was familiar with the group, but actually researching the work um, happened because of this project. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like growing up in Santa Fe and um, in a painting family. You know, the, the, you're, we're from, I was familiar with that time period, but I didn't really understand just how profoundly um, early within the history of abstraction um, these works and these artists took place. Mm -hmm. Right, which is it's amazing that we're just a few years, um, you know, out into manifestos by Kandinsky, and all of a sudden these works appear. Right, I mean, it's just so incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you, I guess, maybe talk about the relationship between, say, um, your position as the choreographer and organizer, and mm -hmm. working with a designer like Patricia? Is that is there a lot of back and forth, or? Um, I mean, you guys have obviously known each other for a long time, um, yeah. but maybe how does that relationship go for um, Gosh, you know, there is a lot of um, discussion and um, what's so amazing now with technology is that, you know, we can, we can text, we can email, we can talk on the phone, we can see each other in person. There's just all these different layers of ways that we can communicate and also um, really different stages in that mm -hmm. process, right? Like you were talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what's important is when you're designing for a client, you have to listen to what, of course, the theme is, their needs, and then be able to change um, very quickly because at the end of the day, you're helping them foresee their vision. So um, Ivan went back to the drawing board just about half an hour ago. <laughs> to do a couple new more looks. And I, you know, cause sometimes after hearing the dancers, then I'm, you know, it's it's hard to stop sometimes as, as an artist, you know, you, you're you only forced to stop when it's over. And so it's not really over yet for me. There's still two more performances. <laughs> so. oh, that's interesting. And so, um, I mean, you, sound, you came from a family of dancers, so you're familiar with that movement when you're, does that influence um, what the designs are or the fabrics, uh, knowing that they'll, these are gonna be danced and performed? And Absolutely. Um, I first give the option of what the textile is going to be, what the fiber is going to be to Dana because he's the one who's commissioning me. So um, there's, you know, we, we thought about doing some silks and stuff so it would be layered, but then he just said, no, I want the longevity for these to be something and then be more sportive. So you'll see, it's it's more of a sport sporty look. And, um, but it it just depends. I just have to listen to the client. That's That's the main objective. But anytime I am designing, my influences have been nature, ceremonies, um, the playground, going down the slide, anything that brings wind. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I think lights turning. You know, when when we were dancing in ceremonies or on, at powwows and we're turning and you feel that lightness, it, it brings a sense of strength and also um, protection like you're you're having a full circle and i think in this day and age it's almost like the transcendental period brings that same kind of feeling mm -hmm. i felt like 
it thematically it was so spot on to what I think of when I'm designing is it's it's that um, emotional state or commitment to something spiritual or something that doesn't have to have any solid purpose. Just like when I design for Native American attire, sometimes like this right here, this is water, but it doesn't, you know, like scream water. It's just a reflection of water and light in the water. So like when you dive into the water and you see all that beautiful light, that's what it is. So I think that this period, it's been a fun piece to work with. Yeah. I think that we're also in a period of um, coming out of a great quieting, right? Where, where we're all sort of in a new state of questioning um, what our life is about, what's important in life. And the transcendentalist, transcendental um, painting group, I think had this question of duality between materialism and spirituality that was going on. And so it just felt really apropos somehow to take that on in, in today's environment. I know yesterday, Dana, we had the pleasure of um, having the dancers perform in front of some of the pieces in our collection. And for the audience maybe wondering why this is not in the museum, our galleries can uh, are not big enough to accommodate the performance as well as an audience of this size. So that's why we're, we are here. But um, you got a chance to get up close and personal with some of those pieces, did that, um, any, Kind of light bulbs go off for you or any specific uh, oh, yeah. and there's these are paintings by uh, Raymond Johnson who was um, a founding kind of faculty member here at the, on campus I think what was so exciting about seeing the juxtaposition of the dancer in such a close proximity to the painting um, for me anyhow was that I could see the relationship of a sort of a sacred geometry that's based, that's that's placed within the way he was painting and designing the lines within the canvas, like the, the different shapes. And to see that relationship to the human body, um, because in Eastern cultures and, and the painting group was very interested in Eastern cultures and philosophies, also in yogic art, in um, um, Hindu art in Tankas, Buddhist paintings, there is a sacred geometry to the body. And I can see how that actually is um, utilized within this time period of abstract art as well. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, it made me think actually, just, just now when you mentioned that, that when you're doing this choreography, obviously you have the artworks in mind, but when you're designing the movements without the art there, mm -hmm. is that, do you like have projections or do the dancers do some study on what the yeah the, the artworks are? And that's a great question. It's sort of all of the all of the above, above. Okay. because um, within the dance studio we do have a large um, projection screen, so we're able to project different works that that we're finding inspiring at the moment. Um, we can experiment with different musical scores mm -hmm. to see which ones align, um, and we always put together for the dancers these um, big Google folders, which they can check in on and they can listen to different scores from the, that time period. They can um, read about the history of different painters. They can look at different examples of the paintings themselves. So they can do that on their own as well. So we have these sort of virtual folders that each dancer can check into now as well. That's great. Right. Yeah. And um, make sure of our time. Yeah, I think we have time for one more. I wanted to at least touch briefly on, um, you mentioned the score, right? So we're um, fortunate today that um, <clears throat> the score is by uh, Dane Rudyard, who was a member of the Transcendental Painters Group. Um, we have in our collection uh, many of his other scores. It was really great to actually hear what the music sounded like. Um, and I guess, Dana, was that part of, did you have multiple things to choose from or what kind of resonated with the specific piece? I here? did, I was looking for different works that were specifically associated with the painting group. And of course, Dane traveled with the group to New Mexico. And he's an interesting individual because um, he was a philosopher and composer and then became this amazing astrologer as well. So he had these like this whole different, you know, this long trajectory of, of um, looking at the way 
music engaged in with the visual arts, but also kind of with the cosmos ultimately. And so we often work with this wonderful pianist, Dana Scott, who you'll um, hear today who flew in with us. And she um, took the score that I was interested in and is uh, will be performing it. But what's interesting about the score is that there is there are these moments of time interpretation by the pianist. And so the tempos can vary, the silence can vary. Um, there's a whole improvisational component that can occur. So it's fascinating in that way also. Right. Well, I think about time we'll, we'll clear out of here and get ready for the performance. So we're gonna clear the table and then the performance will begin shortly after. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank uh-huh. you.